Hey, Wheelchair Gunfighter here. So this video is in response to a bunch of really goofy knife defense videos that um, I've been seeing right lately. And so I wanted to address a lot of stuff that people don't understand about knife attacks. This will be a build on the previous knife attack um, video where we express, uh, explain the principles. This is going to be practical application of that. We'll do a little bit from the wheelchair, um, but it's mostly going to be the same. I want the able-bodied instructors who follow me to be able to see what it is that I'm getting at when I'm talking about these principles. So first of all, um, I want to address some of the myths out there. Um, so let me borrow somebody real quick. Actually, Phil, Will. So these are the myths of what we think. Just back up a little bit. So these are some of the myths that we think work that are actually really bad ideas. Okay. So one of those is when the knife comes in, is turning into it to isolate the hand for, for a defense. So the knife comes in, and the person turns in to isolate the knife. Okay, guys, rotate that whole structure this way. Okay, here's the problem with that. Phil? So correct. Go ahead. Okay, so Phil has full control with his other hand to, has access to the back of Will's head, um, obviously has his legs. I mean, he, he, Will just flanked himself, allowed himself to get flanked. He did all the hard work of flanking for his opponent. The other one is committing two hands to controlling the knife. Now, obviously, we want to control the knife, but by committing two hands to it, um, we've kind of limited what we can do in the process of doing this. We want to multitask. So, by committing just just by committing two hands to the attack, knife comes in and commits two hands. He's completely negating any ability to defend himself from the other hand. One solid shot across the face is a huge disadvantage on his part. Okay. The uh, Last one here is that, okay, for a knife defense, just get a gun. So I want to illustrate exactly why that totally doesn't work. So for illustration purposes, or just to elaborate, we're using these kind of um, high-impact neoprene-covered knives. So for the stuff where we're getting really aggressive, uh, we're, we're minimizing damage here. So, all right, who's, got, who's doing the gun pulling? Okay, so... Phil's going to do a rather violent attack. We're, what we're going to do is we're going to start this off kind of within talking distance, which is where most of this stuff occurs anyway, and then we're going to back it up. So just within this distance, it will, it is, Phil is going to, at his discretion, he's going to attack Will. And when, as soon as Will perceives it, he's going to go for his gun. Okay, so at your discretion, sir. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing again. Will is going to continuously attack. And Phil, I mean, uh, Will is just going to say bang, 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 bang. He's going to continuously go. This drill is not going to end with a first round fired. Go! Bang, 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 bang. Hey, bang. so. I'm a bad man. <laughs> but the a single bullet does not drop someone, at least not in a reliable manner. There's nothing mechanically incapacitating about a handgun bullet. It's just drilling holes to vital organs, and even with solid hits to vital organs, they don't shut down right away. Even with the heart totally shut down, there are cases of enough blood, being enough oxygen in the brain to continue the fight for several seconds. Let's back this up a little bit. So just basically, you guys take two steps back. The same thing. So at your discretion, full on attack. Bang, 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 bang! All right, come back in. Come back in the frame. So, I mean, we could we could continue to back this up, but it's a significant. A, back up a little bit. Back up from each other. About right there is the maximum length that you get from about ninety-five percent of engagements where a handgun is involved. A lot of self-defense stuff. So, all of it occurs in a very close distance. That's about as far as you get. And even within that distance, the amount of time. And Will's kind of fast. Will's pretty fast at getting his handgun out. All right, go ahead and. Go ahead and chill. So some of the, another thing I want to address is some of the myths that people think don't work. One of the big ones there is grabbing the blade for the disarms. Um, the biggest reason why that is perceived not to work is that we're tr a lot of these disarms are done while the fight is still on. You don't grab, you don't try to do this disarm while someone else has their other hand, their legs to continue the attack. You mostly, at least mostly, dazed and incapacitate someone before you start to strip the knife. All right, so that's really, that's really the biggest one. All right, so now we're going to discuss some of the stuff that, um, from a principal perspective, what we're looking at when we're trying to get this stuff to work against an unwilling opponent. 
Now within this environment, when we have someone coming at us with a knife, they're not applying a very committed linear attack and then allowing that person to, um, to uh, perform a technique. When we're being good partners for each other, we're, uh, we're attacking, we're continuously attacking. As they move, we're moving, we're using our other hand, okay? We try to keep it as organic as possible. All right, we're not learning anything if we're just feeding an attack for, to learn a mechanical motion because there's a lot, a lot of nuances within that movement that is uh, generated by resistance by the other person that changes how you have to do the mechanical motion from the very foundation. Will, can I borrow you again? Okay, so here is the general movement. This is the general concept here. Okay, I'm using both hands, okay? You can keep both hands together and move your arms through entire range of motion. I'm using both hands, I'm moving them together. They might not always be together, they might be separated. If I'm at an angle, then if I'm moving both hands together, one is gonna reach him before the other. But as I turn in, the other hand gets, in, gets engaged. Now, this is, this is partly to develop the habit of getting both hands into the fight right away, but also, I'm getting both hands on the knife and it gives me maximum sensory perception about where the knife is in space, and then I can decide between my two hands which one to commit once I'm there. But it gives me a nice reaction point to get to the knife. So the knife comes in nice and slow and I'm putting both hands out and I'm creating a shape to glance off. Okay? I can put my hands out there and I can push the knife to the side. Right? I can lead with this hand. I can lead with this hand. I can get up higher and then come up into something of an attack. The objective here, which is really the key, you're constantly focusing on getting to the upper bone in the arm. If I can control the upper bone of the arm, by control, I mean I'm applying forward pressure. By forward pressure, I'm not trying to, you know, Will's not going to stand here and let me pin his arm to his body. He's going to try to back up and get his arm out to continue to attack me. So, for wheelchair people, it means pulling in and pinning the arm for an able-bodied individual. Can I borrow you, Phil? This means that when he gets the upper bone in the arm, back up that way a little bit. When he gets the upper bone in the arm, he is constantly driving that person backwards. Straight back. If they're, if, okay, come back into frame. If at any point they create a bridge where their, their center of gravity, their centers of gravity are codependent on each other, go ahead and set that up. Okay. If, they're, if they create this thing where they're basically, essentially leaning on each other, but the, um, they're required to lock, to lock to stand. The person trying to control the situation, whoever can change the angle and continue that forward motion. So Phil, being the defender, is going to have to shift his weight slightly. It only has to be a slight angle. So we'll can I borrow your, can I borrow your arms for a second? So really, okay, you can resist movement. Okay, I can resist movement, but all I have to do is change the angle slightly. I'm not pushing off to the side. All I'm doing is applying a slightly... I'm only doing is applying a slightly different angle in the push, and his whole structure is altered. Okay, so if I'm doing the same thing to the upper bone in his arm, and we create this bridge, I just shift, I just shift slightly, and I move around in that direction. Okay, so at no point do I want a bridge. That's where this comes up, and that it's all happening within a fraction of a second. So the key thing, and you can feel it as soon as you lock up, you know that you've made a mistake because if once that codependency becomes a reality. Once that stands still, he now has the ability to shift his hips, make a gap, which is what we're trying to avoid, and attack back. So to keep him from adapting to this defense I'm applying, I immediately, as soon as possible, get high up on one of the, it doesn't have to be the knife hand, one of these upper bones in the arm, and I'm applying a driving pressure in this way as I'm applying incapacitating strikes. If I have a joint, I'm working that. Um, attacking his joints and the legs with my kicks or whatever, being no, obviously not mine, but from an able-bodied perspective. So, this is what it's going to look like in an applied man. Okay, so when you're looking at this, something you need to bear in mind is that we're not looking for a you know a perfect technique to get in a position because this we keep this in a very organic environment where someone is constantly doing a random attack and someone is applying um, the defense in an improvised manner, they're focusing on the goal. Me, as an instructor in this kind of beginner stage, I, I don't care how they get to that position. That's something that we refine over time. 
by inserting little, you know, in between goals, between there and the ultimate goal, which is pinning the upper arm one, and then two is disabling the opponent while maintaining that. So I, you outline the goal, and you will let the student's mind work through how to get there. And the only criteria is that you don't get cut or attempt not to get cut. So you're, what you're going to see here, it's gonna, it, 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 you're not going to see a defined technique. What you're going to see is the end state. Constantly look at the end result. So see how often they get to the upper bone of the arm. And we're going to get it wrong, but that's why we're in a training environment. So you're going to see it's a constantly random thing, but it's, it's, it, it's a, the same thing every time.